Today I want to talk about electromagnetic fields and their speed of propagation. Under Einstein's relativity theory, a lot of physicists and relativists would like you to believe that nothing moves faster than the speed of light. And no objects with matter and mass, stable matter and mass, move faster than light. And light doesn't move faster than light. But that doesn't mean that nothing moves faster than light. And we can see this by looking at Maxwell's equations. One of the implicit assumptions in Maxwell's equation is that the electric and magnetic fields propagate faster than the speed of light. This is similar to gravity. Newton's equations implicit assumption is that gravity is transmitted faster than the speed of light. And I'll cover that in a separate video. So we can see this with Coulomb's law, uh, where you have two bodies of opposite charge that are attracted to each other, they'll move together. And if you have opposite charges, they'll move apart. But say they're attractive and you have a stable orbit. Say one is stationary just for argument. And what will happen is that when the object is here, when it sends its signal, it, the light signal, say it's illuminated, the light signal would arrive at a later time because it takes time. And during that time, the object has moved. So when this object sees this object, it sees it here when it's really here. And I drew a little sketch to try to illustrate that. And so what would happen if the force was directed here instead of here? And what would happen is there would be a, a delay in the force transmission and it would be directed to the wrong place. And if you have two objects moving, then there's a delay on both ends. And what that would do is destabilize all electromagnetic orbits. There would be no stable electromagnetic orbits of any kind. So th that means that atoms couldn't exist. There's also an implicit assumption in photon theory that the electric and magnetic fields travel infinitely. And that's something else that you won't be taught in school. They, they won't say that the electric and magnetic fields propagate at an infinite rate of speed. But if you think about it, you have a wave moving, and the wave has a wavelength. And each half wavelength that moves through a curved region of space. And during that time, there's an electric and magnetic field. There's a rotating electric field, which causes a rotating magnetic field in, in the opposite plane. And so during, while this rotation is going on, the field expands and contracts, expands and contracts. And both the electric and magnetic fields. So if we are trying to come up with a mechanical model, we have some sort of central dipole because an electric charge dipole, a rotating electric charge dipole, is necessary in order to produce a rotating electric field and a rotating magnetic field at the same time. So if we assume a dipole is at the middle, then it will cause the charges of the quantum field to rotate. And that will produce the electric and magnetic fields. But it means that every half wavelength, the electric magnetic fields are, are propagating outward and then collapsing back to zero, propagating outward again, collapsing back to zero at the next half wavelength. And, but we have a problem that each half wavelength, you can only travel a half wavelength under the speed of light limit. 
So if fields were restricted to the speed of light limit, they wouldn't go outside the actual half wavelength of the photon. We wouldn't see propagation of electric and magnetic fields beyond the actual immediate region of the central dipole. So we just have a narrow tube of, of fields and magnetic fields. But instead, we have electric and magnetic fields that, as far as we know, propagate toward infinity. We, we don't have a limit to how far electric and magnetic fields can propagate from photons. We don't know. So as I said, there's this instantaneous propagation assumption implicit in the photon model that is currently accepted. And if we try to do a mechanical model, which I discussed in another video, I'll, I'll put the link below and uh, there's, I put up a little image. And in a real mechanical model of a photon, a composite model, then we really have to deal with those properties. And we can see this when we look at the absorption. If we look at a photon being absorbed at a surface, and the electric and magnetic fields are expanded out, like I said, possibly to infinity, as the photon gets within a half wavelength of the surface where it's being absorbed, if the fields could only move at the speed of light, you would only get a little bit of the field energy that gets back into absorption, which would basically mean that photons would lose half their energy every time they get absorbed, because half of the photon energy is in the electromagnetic fields. And that's something else that doesn't get discussed, but it was something that Einstein and Hoff figured out in the 1910s when they were doing work, work with zero-point field theory. And they realized that the reason that we put one half kb squared, for example, as the energy of a moving body is because we ignore the energy that's in the quantum field. And if we look at the total energy, it's kb squared or mv squared. So we, we get um, mass times speed of light squared, which gives us uh, the total energy in matter. So we typically ignore half the energy when we do kinetic energy equations and other types of uh, equations. But we can't. And in a photon, we generally have, we include it because we can measure the total energy, which includes the field energy once it gets absorbed. But like I said, if, if we had a speed of light limit, then most of the electric and magnetic field is outside the light cone. Uh, that's limited by the speed of light and that energy would be lost. And it's not lost. So we know that the electromagnetic fields collapse very rapidly and that energy does get absorbed by the detector or sensor or electron, basically, that's doing the absorbing. Now, how does electric and magnetic fields propagate faster than light? Well, that's fairly simple to understand if we look at the quantum field model where we assume that quant the quantum field is filled with quantum fluctuations and those quantum fluctuations are dipoles, electric charge dipoles. And we typically use a particle pair model where it could be any real pair of particles like an electron-positron pair as the prototypical example. So, and the Casimir effect confirms this. The Casimir effect tells us that there are van der Waals forces between quantum fluctuations, and van der Waals forces only occur between electric charge dipoles. And those 
So those dipoles interactions that give us Van der Waals forces tell us space is filled with dipoles. But if space is filled with dipoles, then when we have a charge and we have a dipole, they will polarize themselves to a line. Say this is the same charge, or this is opposite this. You, so you get rotation of the dipoles causing polarization through space. And if the dipoles are rotating, they form little quantum magnets. And then the quantum magnet can arrange with its poles north to south relative to a bar magnet. So in this way, the quantum field is polarizable and magnetizable. The electric and magnetic fields are physically real and they involve a real physical mechanism of polarization and magnetization. Well, the key to understanding the velocity is understanding that a quantum dipole can rotate 180 degrees at its maximum wavelength, traveling the distance of that wavelength as it does when it's in a photon. But it only needs to move a little bit in order to polarize space. And that's because the quantum field has vastly more dipoles in it than we have in regular matter. And we can see that by looking at the, the energy estimates for the quantum field. Um, Wheeler made a calculation where the mass equivalent energy of the quantum field is 10 to the 94th grams per cubic centimeter. And we can compare that to the total known mass of the visible universe of 10 to the 56 grams. So there's more energy in my pinky quantum field energy than there is mass in the entire visible universe by many orders of magnitude. So if even a fraction of the quantum fluctuations are, were to be polarized in one direction, in my pinky, my pinky would have a stronger electric field than anything in the universe. So it only requires a few fluctuations, quantum fluctuations, to be polarized a fraction of a degree. And I'm talking about maybe one over one to the minus 20th of a degree type of fraction of a degree. And then you can get um, a a huge magnetic field compared, or electric or magnetic field, compared to what we produce here on Earth. Uh, and especially what we see coming from uh, individual particles. So, because it doesn't have to rotate 180 degrees, they only have to rotate a fraction of a degree, and when one fluctuation rotates, it causes its neighbors to rotate, which causes its neighbors to rotate. So this propagation can occur much, much faster than the speed of light. And that's how electric fields and magnetic fields propagate, much, much faster than the speed of light. How much faster, we don't know. Um, in my example, 10 to the 20th, it could be 10 to the 20th times faster, easily. Because you're looking at a mass energy ratio of 94 orders of magnitude for a typical one cubic centimeter space. If you're doing a ratio of the amount of matter here versus the amount of quantum field energy. So it could be 10 to the 94 times faster than the speed of light. Um, but I mean, we haven't really no one that I know of has gone through the limitations that would give us an exact figure. And the figure may be variable depending on the, the strength of the electric and magnetic field we're dealing with. So anyway, it's very obvious based on Maxwell's equations and, and light that the electric and magnetic fields propagate faster than light. And it's very obvious if we use the quantum field particle model, the particle pair model for the quantum field, we can understand how 
electric and magnetic fields propagate faster than light. And so this causes m many phenomena that are popularly uh, talked about and things like quantum entanglement because any two particles that are quantum entanglement are, in, are coupled by their electric and magnetic fields. Even if they're separated by a distance where a signal traveling at the speed of light would be delayed. And we can also think about why space in the universe is homogeneous. It's homogeneous because, well first the quantum field makes it homogeneous because it's the same everywhere, essentially. And, but there's electric and magnetic fields propagating through space, which transmit information uh, through space about whatever is going on everywhere, which makes space highly uniform, as we see. And those are things that I'll discuss in other videos. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned something about physics that most physicists don't teach because the relativists have given you the wrong idea about the velocity of electric and magnetic fields. And if you're interested in reading more about quantum field research, I have a couple books on quantum field theory and a more recent book on particle theory that also has a lot of quantum field theory in it. And if you like the video, please like, share, and subscribe. And then I have a Patreon account. Uh, I'm an independent researcher, so any support you give me through buying a book or sharing my videos, uh, not monetized yet, but hopefully will be someday, um, will help. And then I'll be able to continue my research and produce more videos. So thanks for watching.